gosh. All right, let's get started. Oh, let's start talking once Josh gets here. All right, let's get started. Uh, before we get into God's Word, let's pray together and uh, offer this as time of worship to God. Uh, could you take off your hat while we pray? Andrew? Thank you. Almost there. Thank you. Good. All right, let's pray. Father, I come before you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we want to worship Him and praise Him because it's only through Him that we can come to you through His blood and through the power of your Spirit, Lord. Lord, as we come to your Word, please convict us with your Word. I pray that the Holy Spirit will come down and convict all of us, Lord, that you will revive all of our hearts, that you'll bring unbelievers here to a knowledge of yourself, Lord, and that we'll be able to know the God of the Bible. Lord, this is impossible unless you act upon our hearts, and that's only done through your word and through your spirit. I pray through this, Lord, that you'll give us sin-killing grace, that we'll be holy for you, Lord, that we'll be willing to lay everything down for you, Lord, because you are infinitely worthy of all our worship. Lord, I pray for this time that we will continually focus on your word and focus on it bringing us closer to you, the only true God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, uh, open up to Genesis 4. That's where we're going to be tonight, and I'm going to read the passage, Genesis 4. Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Again she gave birth to his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground, and Abel on his part also brought the firstlings of his flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering, the Lord had no regard. So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain told his brother Abel, and it came about that when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? He said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is too great to bear. Behold, you have driven me from the face of the ground, and from your face I will be hidden. So I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. So the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain... Vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain, so that no one finding him would slay him. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain had relations with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city Enoch, after the name of his son. Now to Enoch was born Irad. And, to, and Irad became the father of Mahujael, and Mahujael became the father of Methushael, and Methushael became the father of Lamech. Lamech took to himself two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other was Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabal. The, he was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of those who play the lyre and pipe. As for Zillah, she also gave birth to Tubal Cain, the forger of all bronze implements and iron. 
and the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech. Give heed to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me and a boy for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. And Adam had relations with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth. For she said, God has appointed me another offspring in the place of, in the place of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth, to him also was born a son, and he called his name Enosh. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. It's Genesis 4. We're only going to get through the story of Cain and Abel. So we're going to walk through this passage and kind of draw some uh, observations. God put this in the Bible so that we would learn from it. And this is uh, the picture of what an unbeliever and a believer look like. God shows us this theology in the story of two people. So we're going to walk through and make some observations. The first one, the first point is unbelievers have hopeful beginnings. Unbelievers have hopeful beginnings. Verse 1, Adam and Eve get pregnant. Now, this is through the natural means of reproduction. They have a baby. And this is God's grace on them because God, after they <coughs> sinned, sent them out of the garden. But He was still blessing them through letting them have children through the normal means of reproduction. And this is the first baby ever born. Adam and Eve were both formed of God. But this is the first human birth. And so Eve names him Cain, and the name Cain literally means gotten one. I got you, or, uh, or I have acquired. It means I got it. And, and she says, what it literally says here in verse 1 is, I have gotten a man, the Lord. Now God promised that through the woman a seed would be born who would be the Savior, who would crush the devil on his head and fix the sin problem in the world. And so what Eve is saying is, God made a man, now I have, we're going to take care of this sin problem. She thinks she's given birth to the Messiah. And so God's seen as the ultimate giver of life. And so he gives another, uh, in verse 2, next Eve has a second son and names him Abel. And Abel, you know, these, they may have been twins, there's no, uh, it doesn't say how much time was between their birth, but they're the two oldest, second child ever born. And the name Abel means vanity, or breath, or vapor, or frail. And so, I mean, what kind of name is this? Here, I got you, and frail. And she, she could have thought that if she's just given birth to the Messiah, that this second birth is just extraneous. What's the point? Oh, this is vanity. This is futile. What the, but remember, she's going through the pain of childbirth, so she's experiencing the curse on women, which is the pain of childbirth, and she's going, oh my gosh, here comes another one, frail, vapor, and this speaks to Abel's short life. And so Abel, he grows up, uh, he becomes a keeper of the flocks, he's a shepherd, he takes care of the animals, you, may, you could assume maybe that he was a a uh, veterinarian takes care of the animals, and Cain becomes a tiller of the ground or a farmer, and both are fine jobs. They both kind of follow in the way of what Adam did, taking care of the animals, tilling the ground, and uh, growing fruit. And so it's reasonable to assume that Adam and Eve are having other children here, but God uh, draws our attention to these two for a specific reason. It says in Genesis 5-4 that Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters. So Cain and Abel grow up, they get jobs. They get. Uh, we can assume that Cain at least met his wife in this time. And why I assume that is I doubt that he got his wife after he killed his brother. It'd probably be hard to convince someone to marry you after you murdered one of your closest family members. So this takes care of that pesky question that people always ask. Oh, where did Cain get his wife? which I've heard all the time. I have a friend who always asks that. He always uh, does these dumb pictures on Facebook with Adam and Eve and then Cain and Abel and then a question mark under them. And I've answered it several times. I said that he had sons and daughters. He married a sister or a niece. Incest wouldn't have been a problem at this time because the gene pool would have been uh, so rich it wouldn't have been an issue. And I answer it several times and we have a discussion about it. Two, you know, a week later, 
He asks the same question again. So when someone asks that, don't worry, they don't really want an answer. They just want an excuse not to believe the Bible because of their sin. But that's the answer. Verses 3 and 4, moving on from that. So the time came. Sorry, I've got to go. Okay, see you later, John. Tad late. All right. So the time came for Cain and Abel to make an offering to the Lord. It says literally at the end of days. So this wasn't something that they just came up with. They weren't just like, hey, you want to go worship God or something? This was something that uh, they were supposed to do. So they didn't just come up with this system on their own. So it's fair to assume God revealed to them a time and a place and a setting of worship. And he says, and he appoints it, and it's just not recorded in Genesis. So what happens is Cain brings some fruit, the fruit of the ground from his job, and Abel brings the best animals of his flock. Now, there's a question here, why are the Lord's specifications about this sacrifice not recorded here? Why didn't he, why isn't it said exactly what God wants here? Well, there's a few answers to that. One is because this is a descriptive historical text, and the point here is not the sacrifice, it's the people and God. This isn't a law book. It's not Leviticus. It's not the how-to of it. It's not, okay, this is how you make a sacrifice. This is exactly how you do it. It's just saying God told them to make a sacrifice. God told them what to do. And this is what happened in the story. And I think what we're main, uh, what we're meant to get from this is not the sacrifice itself, but the Lord's reaction to it. God sees what we don't. And the text illustrates that worship it, it's, it doesn't show us what God told them to do. So it just shows us that the important thing in worship is pleasing the one you're worshiping. It's about the one you're worshiping, not, not the things you bring, not the things you do, though those are important. It's about pleasing the one who is worshipped. So if the one who is supposed to be worshipped is not pleased, there's something wrong. And so that's the main point. And so if God is displeased with Cain, that's what we need to know. There's something wrong that Cain did. Another thing is Abel also knew to bring not only the best animals, but the best animals and their fat portions. Now, so fat is talked about extensively in the Old Testament sacrificial system. Uh, Leviticus 3.16, talking about sacrifices, says all fat is the Lord's. Also a great dieting verse. Just kidding. (laughs) Sorry, they're running late. Okay. And animals would also make a better object lesson for atonement than fruit, right? God's just going with the system that we see throughout the Bible. And don't think, oh, well, Cain and poor Cain and Abel, they didn't have the Bible. They didn't know what was going on. Don't think that. God spoke to them directly. Their parents were Adam and Eve. They lived and saw God face to face. If anyone knows about theology or knows about the word of God, it should be them, right? So they knew exactly what they were supposed to do. And Hebrews 9.22 in the New Testament says, And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Unless blood is shed, there is no forgiveness. So remember, Abel was a keeper of the flocks, right? But we shouldn't think that, oh, well, he just did what was natural to his job. No. He made a sacrifice that was strange to him. It's It's not like animals were eaten back then. Animals were not eaten until after the flood. So it wasn't like Abel was like, oh, I I cook up lamb all the time. This is just going to be something else like that. He had to put to death an animal, which wasn't done until Genesis 9-3 after the flood for food. So this is a specific thing that Abel does. Cain's fruit, it's just normal food. It's, It's what he always ate. It's what he grew. It's what everyone ate. So both should have remembered from their parents the story. Surely their parents would have told them and God would have revealed to them that since they ate the fruit in the garden, they deserve death. God said, if you eat this fruit, you will die. Therefore, death needed a covering. And it's clear that Abel didn't just walk backwards blindly into making the right sacrifice, but his sacrifice was careful, faithful, and obedient. There needed to be a covering. They knew that they deserved death. They knew that their parents deserved death for sinning against God, yet that's not what their parents had. 
There needed to be something that covered sin. That brings us to point number two. Unbelievers offer insufficient worship. Verse 5. It's important to note here, there are two realities that it talks about in verse 5. It says that God rejects Cain and his offering. He accepts Abel and what Abel brought. He, if the false worshiper is rejected, so is the worship, whatever it is. If the, if the worshiper brings false worship, it is all rejected together. God rejects the act and rejects the person in false worship. And it's obvious God was displeased with Cain's sacrifice. We don't know exactly how this played out. God could have just told Cain. Adam could have told Cain, maybe as the high priest of the family. Some people think that a fire of, a uh, fire of pillar, a pillar of fire came down and took Abel's sacrifice, but didn't take Cain's. But it's more likely that they came, made their sacrifice, went on their way, and God starts blessing the life of Abel. And things start going good for Abel because he obeyed God and loved God. And Cain starts getting frustrated. His things are not going well for him. He's getting mad and angry and upset. And things, obviously God's not happy with him. That's what uh, John Calvin thought. And so what was better about Abel's sacrifice than Cain's? Hebrews 11.4, the New Testament sheds some light on this. Hebrews 11.4, by faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. It was by faith that Abel made his offering, and by that faith, God saw him as righteous. You know, it could be said that Cain's offering pointed backwards, but Abel's pointed forward. Cain's offering pointed backwards to the garden, to the world. Abel's offering pointed forward to the new covenant, to Christ. Salvation that is based on works. This is what Cain's trying to do. He brought his, the strength of the ground, the fruit of the ground. He thinks he's going to bring something that's going to impress God from him. Not taking into account that God's the creator. He thinks he's going to point to the glory and the strength and the success of man. He thinks he's going to show what man can bring God. And salvation that is based on works is really just trying to be so good that God owes us something and is indebted to us. That's what Cain is trying to do. That's what his offering meant. And you know what? People will go to hell just to prove that they're right. And that's what Cain did. He wanted to be right. He wanted to do it his way so badly that he would have God be displeased with him, have a shattered relationship with God, do whatever it took as long as he could have it his way. And that's all of us apart from the grace of God. We will forcefully, stubbornly continue to do things our way unless God gives us faith, God gives us repentance. And this is the point here. You know, the great question of Scripture is how can a God who is holy and righteous and just still be just and a just judge and allow sinners not to be punished, not kill them. This is the greatest question of Scripture. If God is holy and hates sin, how can he let sinful, vile, wicked people like you and me, like Cain and Abel, how can he let us go? How can he be just and justify, meaning to declare righteous, sinful people? That there's a covering that had to be made. Sin had to be paid for. And that's the point 
That's why God had Abel make that offering. Hebrews 12.24, Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. The point of the whole Old Testament sacrificial system was Christ. The Jewish religion and Judaism, all the religious uh, things in it, they're all visual. They all come in through the eyes. Christianity and Western religions, it's more through the conscience, through the mind, through the hearing, like what we're doing now. But Judaism, it's through the eyes. It's through the senses. Everything had a meaning. And what that animal sacrifice was, was a shadow. These were just a shadow of the reality which was in Christ and His blood which was able to actually take away sins. And that goes back and answers the question that all these sacrifices pointed forward so God can be just and show His justice by punishing His Son and at the same time make payment for sinners and let them go free. That's the point of the offering. The key thing missing from Cain's offering was faith. Romans 14.23 B says, and without faith it is impossible to please him. Another reason Cain probably wanted to go his own way, just added on there, was what should Cain have brought? I mean, just kind of from the passage, what do we get? What should he have done? Animal Animal sacrifices. Who's the keeper of the flocks? Abel, his younger brother. So Cain looks at the situation, I'm thinking, and goes, no, I am not going to go to my younger brother for this sacrifice. He gets to bring something from his job. I will bring something with mine. God will be happy with it. This is how it's going to be. I'm going to make mine so much better than whatever he's bringing. And that's what Cain does. But here's the point, 1 Samuel 15, 22. The point was not who could bring the best sacrifice. 1 Samuel 15, 22. Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than a sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. What God wants is for them to do what He says. Because it points to his son. And by Cain not doing what he says, he dishonored Christ. And God thinks a lot of Christ. He who does not honor the son does not honor the father. We know from scripture, Hebrews 10.4, that the blood of bulls and goats couldn't take away sin. None of the Old Testament sacrifices, they were always a picture. None of them took away sin. None of them ever paid for sin. It was just so that people could see the blood and see that the sacrifices weren't working and that an ultimate sacrifice had to come. These sacrifices were just a shadow. A shadow is a real thing, but it's only a part of the reality, which is Christ. And because of that, the offerings had to be made continually, year after year, and they had to constantly make sacrifices, and there would be constantly blood flowing over the altar. But they could never make anyone perfect. They could never make anyone right before God. And so they had to constantly be offered. And it says in Isaiah 111 that God takes no pleasure in the blood of bulls or lambs or goats. And in the context of Isaiah, these wicked people making thousands upon thousands of sacrifices, thinking that's what made them right before God, is not the case. Here's the main point. 1 Samuel 16, 7. For God sees, not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You know, in the eyes of the world, just from what we would see, a nice fruit basket, the fruit of the ground, prepared, put together, would probably look a lot better than roadkill, right? But that's why it took faith. Abel's sacrifice was not meant to be pretty. It was meant to make the point that God wanted it to make. We know in Genesis 2.9 that God made all trees pleasing to the sight. 
we know that they looked good. In fact, Eve, she looked at the fruit on the tree and saw that it was pleasing to what? Pleasing to the eyes? Good for food? It looks good. It looks better than a dead animal. But here are some reasons why God probably would not have wanted fruit as his offering. God cursed the ground from which fruit is taken. Genesis 3.17 The earth is under a curse. Fruit was what Adam and Eve ate that cast all humanity into sin and got them kicked out of the garden. Why would he offer fruit? From a fruit tree, from a fig tree, Adam and Eve took leaves and they tried to cover themselves and hide themselves from God and made insufficient coverings until God covered them in Genesis 3.21 with the skin of an animal. Luke 16.15 Jesus says, You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your heart. For that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. God takes his worship seriously. That which everyone sees, which looks great to people, which people like and esteem, something gross and disgusting to God. Another reason why the specifics of the offering may not have been included is because us looking at it, we say both of them look okay, they look fine. What's, what's wrong with them? But God sees what we don't. He sees the hearts. And that should be terrifying for anyone coming to worship God. You may get some praise from men for being the most religious, most worshipful person in town, but God knows the heart, and who we are in here is who we are. Not who we are when we come to youth group, not who we are when we come to church, not who we are when we're with our Christian friends or when we're with our parents. Who we are in our heart and our mind is who we really are, and God sees that. Don't be deceived. God doesn't, uh, doesn't accept all sacrifices of worship. He demands true worship. And God will not accept anything less than true worship. We have to worship Him in spirit and in truth, meaning from the inside out and according to His truth is the only way God accepts worship. And you know, we're in America, in the United States, we're used to the idea of user-friendly worship. Well, I'm getting, my, I'm not, that worship service just didn't have it. And my felt needs weren't being met and all this nonsense. But God takes his worship very seriously. Especially those of us who administer worship. God killed two worship leaders in Leviticus. He killed two priests. Leviticus 10.3 After Aaron's sons have been killed and Aaron comes over to his brother Moses, what the heck is going on? Why are my sons dead? This is what Moses said to him. It is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. And before all the people, I will be honored. So Aaron, therefore, kept silent. It's one of those places in Scripture where, where it makes an understatement. You better believe that after Moses spoke that to him directly from God, yeah, Aaron kept silent. God says, I will be treated as holy. God will not accept anything less from us. And you know, there should be a feeling of crossing over into a place that is sacred, into a place that is holy when people come into church, our church, any church, any true church. There should be a sense that there's something different and sacred here. But how often do we worship God 
with worship that we, even we ourselves would say is acceptable, much less God? How much do we come unprepared? How much do we let ourselves get distracted? And yes, there is an element in there that when we get distracted from the scripture reading or the singing, that we pull our minds back, pull our focus back to God, pull it back to God, and that's learning to love God with our minds. But so often we just continue to let ourselves get distracted with everything else. Things that we never think about, we think about in the worship service. How often we make things about us. We are chronically self-centered. We can't think without thinking about us. Ecclesiastes 5.1 Guard your steps as you go into the house of God and draw near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. And I tell you, I mean, with some of these youth groups especially, it happens in all churches, and this happens in Bible-believing churches. There are people who come and make worship this weird, crazy thing, not in a good way. They come and make it all about them. They're the loudest ones singing. They're, the, they're dancing around. They're doing all kinds of nonsense. They're offering the sacrifice of fools, yet if you ask them anything about the God they're worshiping, they wouldn't know anything at all. And the saddest part is, we all do this to some extent, and we don't even know that we're offering the sacrifice of fools. We don't even know we're doing evil. God help us. Do you realize if God had not had grace on us when we were out there singing, that probably all of us would be dead? We are all sinners. Psalm 76, 11. Let all who are around him bring gifts to him who is to be feared. God is to be feared in worship. Yes, that means respect, but it means a healthy fear of God. Approaching one who is holy, holy, holy. I can almost guarantee, and, and you know, the thing is, in every worship service, this is going to happen Sunday, which has become the biggest day of idolatry in the world because everyone comes worshiping something besides God. This happens all the time. I can guarantee that there are people, maybe even here tonight, who are living in unrepentant sin, and it's not phasing them at all. They're living in unrepentant sin, and no one knows except themselves or there could be people in here who are planning to sin right now or who are planning to sin during the worship service planning to do things disobey their parents planning to look at pornography at 2 in the morning planning to do all kinds of things I mean they People leave the worship service and then they go off and they do all kinds of wickedness and it doesn't faze them at all. And I'm not talking about a Christian who struggles and gets up and continues the fight of sin. I'm talking about the unbelievers who come here and think that they're faking everyone out and that no one knows. Maybe no one here does know, but God sees each heart. And there are people, maybe even sitting before the preached word, either here or on Sunday mornings, with no problem. And unless the Spirit of God gets into their hearts, they're going to leave unchanged and go sin. And it's not going to matter to them at all. It's not even going to occur to them. And that's all of us without the grace of God, without a picture of the holiness of God. It's one thing to know the Word of God. It's another thing to know the God of the Word. He is holy. And this is Cain. Cain is applicable for today. He's applicable for all of us. Ezekiel thirty-three thirty-one, Describing worship, he says, They come to you as people come. 
and sit before you as my people and hear your words, but they do not do them. For they do the lustful desires expressed by their mouth, and their heart goes after gain. There is a possibility of getting fleshly gain from coming to worship even a biblical Christian Christ-honoring worship. Our sin can change anything pure and beautiful and holy into something sinful. But what they want, what people want, when they come and they worship, they come and do man-made, man-centered worship, What they want is not surrender. They don't want to see God. They don't want to know God. They don't want to see His glory. They don't want to learn about His holiness. They don't want a picture of Him. They don't want to honor Christ. They want the gain that is possible in Christian worship. Now let's look at Cain's reaction to God's rejection. God rejects Cain's worship. And Cain... His, his reaction, anger, and his countenance fell, meaning he, he frowned, but it's more than that. He, he was downcast. He, he was broken in the sense that he, he just was frustrated. He was upset, and it was obvious. But the fact that Cain gets angry and upset, he doesn't get angry and upset at himself. He gets angry and upset at God. That shows where his heart was truly at. He was like, oh, I will bring God the greatest offering of fruit ever. And then God takes it away and he's like, uh, uh, and gets all mad. <laughs> that shows where the, his heart's at. You know, if he, he was genuinely trying to worship God, he would have been heartbroken and repentant after his worship was rejected and would have done the right thing. God could have killed Cain could have rightly killed him when he offered what he offered. But he didn't. And he could have killed him again when he got angry. Verses four, uh, chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Let's look at how God deals with Cain. Now, this is kind of to sum up what God is kind of saying to Cain. Why are you angry? What do you have that look on your face for? I told you what to do and you did not do it. Are you really surprised? Do you think I'm going to take that offering? Especially with that heart attitude. I mean, God doesn't even say that much. But listen to this, Proverbs 21, 27. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. How much more when he brings it with evil intent? An abomination in Scripture is something that God absolutely hates and detests, wants nothing near Him. So it would be better for the wicked not to come to worship, unless it's to repent, than to come at all. Especially when they come with evil intent. With an intent that is not focused on gaining God in worship. And we all have that tendency, whether we're believers or not. We all can lose our focus in that. But the idea that God's fine, you know, with whatever worship I bring Him, as as long as it's from the heart, that's not true. It isn't true. Well, I can worship God on my motorcycle or at Disneyland, you know, but, but God forbid I worship Him in the church with the people of God. You know, that's, that's what people do all the time. Oh, I, I don't need to go to church. There's no specific church command in the Bible. I don't need to be with God's people and worship the one who saved me from my sins. That's, that's what people are saying. Oh, God's fine with whatever worship I bring him. It's not true. He demands true worship. And there's something really important for here for how God deals with sin. And it's important for us. God asks Cain a question. Verse 7, he goes, Why are you angry? He doesn't just point out the fact that Cain is angry and tells him to quit. He 
he gets to a deeper level with Cain. Cain, what is it in you that because I rejected this is making you angry? What are you trying to gain by being angry? Go to a deeper level. Think about your anger. And God just gives it to him logically. If you do well, you will be accepted. If you do what I tell you, your life is not going to be hard. You know, Proverbs says, the way of a transgressor is hard. Psalm 16, those who have bartered for another God, their sorrows will be multiplied. They're going to be exponential hardness and sorrows for those who disobey God. For those who don't do it God's way, it's sorrow upon sorrow. So God gives him something really important here. Let's pay attention to this because this is really important for how we deal with our sins. It's amazing. It's like a little glimpse of the book of Romans right here in the first four chapters of Genesis. He says if, if he repents and he submits, then he's insulated against sin. True worship of God does that. He says, Cain, you need to give this up. You need to submit. Do it my way. This is hard for you. And it's going to continue to be hard for you. And it's only going to get harder. Give it up. Do it my way. I know better than you. Repent. Do it God's way. That's the, that's the point here. So the only way to insulate against sin is true worship of God. There must be true worship. But there, God gives him the other side. If he doesn't, do it God's way. Sin is always there, ready to take over wherever it can. Sin is always there trying to bring whoever it can into bondage and slavery. And so God gives him the option. He says, you can be God's slave or you can be slave of sin. The thing with the slave of sin is it lets people think that they're in control, but they are slaves. God gives them the option. You will either be my slave or you will be a slave of your sin. You have to master your sin, Cain, and you can't do it unless you're my slave. It will master you. It's crouching at the door. You can't overtake it. As Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. Cain wanted both. He wanted to serve his sin. He wanted to do things his way. Yet at the same time, he wanted to worship God and get the blessing of worshiping God. God says, God doesn't take half-hearted. God doesn't take the person's works and bless them and not take the person's heart. God takes all of it. God takes the person's mind. God takes the person's will. God takes the person's emotions. All of it must belong to God for him to be safe from sin. Romans 6.16, it says the same thing that's here in Genesis, do you not know that when you present yourselves as someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? So it says, whoever is obeying something, that's their master. Continuing on, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. Yeah, you may feel, we may feel we're in charge when we're the slave of sin, but the bill of goods at the end of that is death. It will give us hardship, it will give us sorrow, and it will end in death. Why do we want to do it that way? Because of our stubbornness and unrepentant heart. God's way ends in life. It ends in righteousness. It ends in God's righteousness in us. You know, this principle is so important for us. We are slaves. We may not know it. We are slaves. And there are only two options biblically. You are either a slave of sin, you are either a slave of sin or a slave of Christ. 
There are no two masters. You're either a slave of worldliness, love of money, pleasing people, or to the worst taskmaster of all, ourselves. We are the worst slave master to have. No one has lied to, hurt, or done more against ourselves than we have. And we think that we who use our car keys like monthly should be the sovereign over our lives. Or we can be slaves of Christ. And what a slave means is you not only say that you're a slave, but you lay it down, your will is given to that person. They own you. And either you are owned by Christ, or we are owned by sin. We cannot master sin unless God is our master. And Romans 6.12 in that same passage says, Do not let sin reign. Meaning that's a possibility that it's possible for us to overtake our sin if we are a slave of God. Dethrone it. Take it out. Kill it. Fight your sin. That's not saying that we won't fall and get up and fall and get up, but we will fight our sin. If anyone is in Christ, he has been made a soldier of God, and Christ has already won. He's taken over. And why we are one reason why we are left here to deal with our sin and God doesn't just take away all our struggle with sin is because through us continually fighting, through saying no to sin and saying no, I choose to love God more, He is glorified. That He can take an unholy sinner out of an unholy world, make Him holy and put Him back in that holy world and keep Him saved until heaven. And that's what God does with every believer. He saves them completely. And he, we win. We are the soldiers of Christ. Dethrone your sin. Choose to delight in God. Revel in the fact that we can say, No, this offers some temporary false pleasure. But I choose to go to God in whose presence is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore, the true source of pleasure, and love Him and follow His commands because that leads to life and righteousness. And the promise is given to all believers, Romans 6.14, Sin shall not be master over you. Sin will not be win the battle. Sin shall not be master over you. This is the promise that God gives every believer. This is the promise He holds out to Cain. So let's see what Cain does. Verse 8. Cain talks to Abel, probably telling him what happened. Telling him his conversation with God. We don't know exactly what happened in the conversation. And so Cain makes his choice. He couldn't kill God because that's impossible. So he killed his brother Abel, who is God's image and reminded him of God. First human death. The first human death was a murder. This is the first martyr, someone who died for the sake of righteousness, died as a witness of God. First human death, we may have thought that sin would take a few generations to really manifest itself in evil, ugly, heinous ways. But no, first two kids ends in a murder. That brings us to point number three. Unbelievers cannot stand true believers. Cain chose sin as his master rather than God. Cain said, I would rather end in death. I would rather have all kinds of consequences and punishments on me than have God control my life. Because at least this way, I can feel like I'm in control. He's the ultimate example of an apostate, which means someone who comes right to the edge of saving faith and rejects it. uh, The book of Jude, which is all about false prophets and false teachers and apostates, people who turn away from the faith, showing that they were never really saved, says Jude 11, Woe to them! 
for they have gone the way of Cain. See, in the New Testament, Cain becomes a proverb for those who have turned away from God when they have every opportunity to turn to Him and be saved. Verse 9, God, knowing exactly what had happened, asks Cain a question just like He asked His parents in Genesis 3. Cain lies. He flat out lies, showing that God is not his master and that sin is. And he, first instance of sarcasm in the Bible, he goes, God asks, where is Abel your brother? And he says, I do not know. Lie. And he says, am I my brother's keeper? What was Abel? He was a keeper of the flocks. He said, am I my brother's keeper? Third time, right there, God could have killed him dead. Scorning God to his face? Cain is in serious trouble here. Verses 10 through 15. God asks Cain what he has done and says that Abel's blood cries to him from the ground, meaning Abel's blood and even the ground is crying out for justice. It knows that Cain should be put to death for what he did. God places an additional curse on Cain that the earth wouldn't yield fruit for him any longer. Basically a death sentence for a farmer. Think about it. Cain would have to depend on others for food the rest of his life. There was no meat at this time. That's not until Genesis 9. That's after the flood. He would have to depend on everyone else giving him food. He'd be extremely easy to take advantage of in this situation. So God chose to level Cain's pride, make him dependent, make him humble. And... Before, where he might have had trouble humbling himself just to go to his brother and get uh, an animal for the proper sacrifice, now he was going to have to go to everyone for everything and depend on people just for the basic necessities of life. Imagine what that would be like having to go ask someone to get you food every time you needed to eat. And the fruit that Cain was probably so proud of is as he's offering it to God, he's showing God this great worship. And we, it's possible that Cain, when he said, God, you want blood sacrifices, went and killed Abel and gave God his blood. In the same way, God says, that fruit you are so proud of, that's never going to happen for you again. What you were offering me, that worship, I'm going to make sure you never come near that again. That's what God does. His source of pride was gone forever. You'd think this would lead him to repentance. So Cain reacts by saying, My punishment is too great to bear. He says his sin is too overwhelming, too severe. That God's being too hard on him. And he says, I'll be driven away from the face of the ground, and from your face I'll be hidden. So he goes from, am I my brother's keeper? To, God, if you send me away, we can't hang out anymore. This is ridiculous, what he's saying here. He's going, God, you've got to be kidding me. You can't do this to me. This is too much for me to handle. Notice what Cain points out. The consequences. Not the fact that he dishonored God, murdered Abel, scorned God to his face, and lied about it. He says, no, the, the punishment is what he cares about. He, and he worried that he would go around, he says, whoever finds me is going to kill me. He knew that he deserved to die. But God doesn't kill him. And there are Probably several reasons for that. God sovereignly still wanted to produce children through him, wanted to produce other things through him. And God shows common grace here. He shows grace to an unbeliever just by letting him live, even though his life would be continually hard. And there was no government in place at the time to take capital punishment against Cain. The death penalty is uh, instituted in Scripture in Genesis 9, 6, right after the flood, though. So God is gracious and promises that if anyone takes Cain's life, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And he gives Cain an obvious mark that is a mark of God's protection on him, not judgment. Now, let me say one thing. <clears throat> no one knows what the mark of Cain was. Nobody. Don't come up after and tell me you know what it is. 
Don't come up after and tell me your theory of what it is. Don't tell me you had a teacher who explained the whole thing to you and now you see it. Scripture does not say what the mark of Cain was and why it was not a skin color. We do not know other than it was a mark. Okay? And the reason why I say that is because that has been used in a racist way to say the people of black skin were, had the mark of Cain on them and it was used as uh, an excuse to take over Africa and different places by uh, the English. <laughs> so don't tell me you know what the mark of Cain is because no one does. No one. No one. <laughs> okay. Did, <laughs> did Cain truly repent? Verse 16. Final thing we have on Cain, basically. Cain leaves the presence of the Lord. Probably one of the saddest verses in the Bible. He goes away. He'd rather be away from God. He's given as an example of apostasy we read in Jude. 1 John 3, 11 and 12 says, For this is the message that we have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. That's why Cain killed him. Jealousy that turned into a jealous rage. Unrighteous people don't like righteous people who are a mirror to them. And John points this out in the context of love with believers, saying, don't be like Cain. He's not worried about us killing each other in the church. What he's making the point is, when someone is growing or progressing in an area, don't be like Cain and, be, yeah, and point out some other weakness in them. That's what John is saying here in the context of love. Now, there are still many who worship just like Cain did. Jesus said that, all, that the people who rejected him, that even Abel's blood would be charged against them. Matthew 23 and Luke 11. And I promise that the punishment will be much more severe for those who reject the Son of God, Jesus Christ, than for, those, than for Cain rejecting his sacrifice. God's common grace was meant to lead Cain and us to repentance. Romans 2, 4, and 5, right there, almost done. Romans 2, 4, and 5, or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the patience of God leads you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. God's kindness is not so that we think we get away with things. God's forbearance, God's patience with us, is to give us time to repent and turn to Him. Psalm 51, 17, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, God, you will not despise. What God wants is surrender. He wants repentance. He wants us to lay everything down, and He wants a broken spirit. We need to offer God this worship. We can only worship Him through the payment of His Son and put no confidence in our flesh. Let's pray and then go to small groups. Lord, we thank You for this time. Lord, we pray that You forgive us for the times we have not honored You, especially in Your public worship, Lord. I pray that You'll forgive us, Lord, that you have mercy on us and grace on us as you have. That we will worship you in spirit and truth, Lord. And that we'll take worshiping you as our Holy Father seriously, Lord. We thank you that we, there is the possibility of worshiping you through the blood of Jesus that intercedes for us. And through the power of the Spirit. Lord, now I pray for small groups that we have a profitable time of discussion and growth. Discussing how we can grow in our worship of you. Jesus' name, amen.